Check my speaker. Start my video. Why would I continue recording? Start my video. Participants, camera and admit. Bunch of folks are hacking the dock already. Hey, Cameron. Dun, dun, dun. Let's see here. Pause. Hi, this is uh, Coffee Compiler Club. And uh, we're here to talk about compilers and language implementations and runtimes and anything to do with typing systems and garbage collections and enums and hash table implementations. I know that's hot on some people's list here. And, um, you know, anything else to do with basically implementing languages? Um, you're being recorded. Uh, you'll show up on YouTube within a couple hours, typically. And if you don't like that, bail out now. Open mic, say what you want. Mute yourself if you're not talking so we don't get a lot of background noise. I don't have any set agenda. Um, I, we have Jonathan Blow as a new guest today. Um, and that's my starting spiel. And so I know that Simon's been busy in the Google Docs, but I want to let Jonathan give us 20 seconds of why you're here. And then you, you and I had a discussion that was very interesting, and I wanted to carry it on in this forum. Yeah, well, I mean, talking about compilers is cool, right? So that's always fun. Um, and I did, you know, I was watching, I think, last week's episode. And uh, there was some discussion of hash tables. And that, that was kind of interesting because uh, it, like, it kicked off some thoughts. And then I did some experiments. And I have some stuff maybe to, to say about what I did. But uh, I could use a couple more minutes to figure because like I'm copying a file over and whatever and it's all yeah. good. But um, I also did some experiments on what we talked about. Oh, geez, I did too. And, yeah. and, and some of my results were less than pleasing. Ooh, excellent. Well, while yeah. we start with the negative results, Cameron, if you're ready to go, my results are easy and cheap. Well, so I have to preface this with, you know, so I'm, I'm not working on a a uh, uh, runtime that any of you are using. So there are some rules that are a little bit different. And um, one, of, one of the implementation details is right now in our prototype, we always cache the hash codes for, for all constants. And so as it turns out, adding hash code con, adding, adding hash code caching to a map in a system, in a language where the in a runtime system where the hash codes are already cached has cost and no benefit. Uh. So, um, <laughs> so, 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 uh, but um, uh, th that was the only, that was the only major negative surprise. How, how did you cache them in the map? How did you cache them in the map? Uh, just, well, I, I did two different implementations uh, of this, I did a one that was a combined cache, a positive negative combined cache of the last key, and then I did a separate implementation with a positive uh, and a separate negative uh, uh, key cache. So, so just last key, last miss, and last hit cached, and then just last hit or miss cached. And in both cases, there was a slight negative because the, as I said, the um, hash code was already being cached by all the by all the key objects themselves. So, so that was, uh, and then um, and then I did about twenty different implement, <laughs> at least a dozen different implementations of uh, uh, stable iterator um, implementations. So basically, an iterator that is stable in the presence of modifications. Um, so I ended up with a copy on write implementation, uh, but I did a number of Say different stable. You mean it doesn't crash if you insert a delete, as opposed to, for instance, it's always produces results in alphabetical order. So uh, stable. Let me read the contract. <laughs> Mark, have you heard any of this? Maybe uh, deterministic. It, it, I forgot it. It was like an hour ago. <laughs> So the iterators provided by this map are stable in the presence of structural changes to the map and will not throw concurrent modification, return duplicate entries, return entries that have been removed, or skip entries which remain present over the course of iteration. The iterator may return entries which were inserted after the creation of the iterator. 
but it will not return entries that are removed during iteration. At the start of the iterator, there were some entries. While yeah. the iterator is running, somebody else unrelated removed them, and you'll <laughs> agree that you won't ever return them, even Correct. if on the very first clock cycle, the very first one that comes up is immediately. Correct. Yes. OK, I, I claim you have a bug, or you have a contract failure right there, because exactly the case I just gave. You say, I make a stable iterator, and the yeah. next clock cycle, the very first entry that comes up is one I want to hand out. I hand it out as part of the iteration. I go on to the next iterator. Somebody comes behind and yanks that guy out from me. It was removed during iteration, but I already presented it. Correct. Is that and, most of, and that's a actually a very, it's a very, very common thing, actually, when you're iterating right. to remove something that you just iterated. Not, not even you. Somebody else removes it. I, I'm claiming I heard you say that you'll not return anybody who gets removed during iteration. And, and, and I was thinking that wasn't quite right. You may it, return it people. It explicitly who says it will not return entries that have been removed. OK, so, so there is a, a, a theory that says the has been has a linearization point that says it's been removed already. It's done. And at that point, you won't return it. But right. if it's still in presence, OK, fine. Yeah, then that works. Sorry. And this is because, uh, let me be a little opinionated on the topic. Java's iterator has delete in it, yeah. which is a design flaw. So uh, well, it's totally convenient to remove an element on while you're iterating. Convenience is not a, um, a winning argument for design flaw. I don't claim that's a design. OK, why is it a design flaw? I don't think it's a design flaw. Because it's, it's an design. iterator. It's not yep. a deleter, like a uh, filter. It, you know, it's an remove? iterator, not a filter. Remove from where? Yeah, right. From? This is the remove one. Yeah, and and you know, in Java eight, even you can throw a lambda in that basically iterates and removes based on a predicate. It's a filter. Yeah, I think you'd be so. hap happier if it was called a cursor instead of an iterator. I I called it a mutator. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> a, mut a mutilator. Yeah. I'm, I'm of the opinion that it's okay to remove during the iteration. Reason, the reason that it exists is because it allowed Josh to do a very nice API at the time. But to do that, you had to implement iterator, and then everything could be implemented on top of it. Like, like uh, you know, so if you look, it's the fact that it's in the iterator interface isn't because it belongs there. It's because it allowed Josh to do an abstract implementation very nicely. So I have, I have no problem with the implementation. I have a problem with the design, so. Okay. Well, maybe, I, maybe it ought to have been split into two interfaces, the iterator that you would like, and then the mutilator that extends it, that has the remove method. Right, and actually our list has a cursor interface in it that does allow insertion and deletion and other things like that, so yeah. All right, I, I so, certainly make- the Keith, Keith's point was spot on. Cursor is the correct, uh, the cursor uh, is the correct, uh, I can't name. think of the words. You're claiming yes. a name change fixes the problem. Yes, which maybe it does. Happen. Sure. I would expect the iterator just to iterate. Yes. To not... That's a reasonable right. thing for an iterator to do. Right. Yep. And, and the, the <laughs> claim here is that it, it iterates, but then that doesn't make sense on a thing that is changing, whereas huh. a cursor makes sense on a thing that is changing, and you're advancing a cursor through. Right. And cursor is also bidirectional, which is. Yeah. Handy. Yeah, that's right. Like so, I mean, I want to agree with you, Cameron, but, uh, and, and supporting that, there's lots of implementations of iterator that just say, you know, unsupported operation exception when you call the remove method. Yeah, yeah. They don't really implement it if they say that, in my opinion. Yeah, but it's, 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 uh, it's generally, a bad, generally a bad sign when 82% of your implementations say not implemented. Right. Uh, all right. I only use ones that implement it, but I don't use very many. I there's like five data structures I use. And, you know, and, and I want to be clear, like I, I'm calling it a design flaw, but you know, fine. The, the guy who designed it is one of the greatest software designers I've ever met. So I don't wanna <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> I think he got this one wrong, but I still to total right. respect. <clears throat> All right, I want I want to throw my two bits in and then see where Joe's at. So Joe and I had this discussion about reprobes being divergent versus not divergent. Whereas uh, uh, the, the notion is if you're reprobing into a hash table because you have a collision, 
and your, your reprobe takes you to a spot that an unrelated guy who you collided with, when he reprobes, goes to the same spot. So for example, you reprobe like plus one, then the, the, some guy makes hits and goes to the next entry. Somebody hits one of these two, he ends up at the third entry. And somebody hits one of these three, he ends up at the fourth entry. And you get this wad of guys that are solidly in a row that are all, because your reprobing's not divergent, they hit somewhere in the middle and then they walk to the end and then they discover you know, their element or they find a blank and they can go there. And you get these chunks in a row. Now I said plus one, but it's any plus that would be modulo the table. So you can be plus 17 or prime numbers or whatever you want to do. And if everyone's striding along the same thing, it's the same wad, just spread out or not, but it's the same set of hits. Whereas a divergent reprobe would say, upon hitting here, instead of adding one, I add something that's unique to me, but not the same as the other guy who hit here. And I'll reprobe here and he'll reprobe there and we'll end up in different places. And so our reprobes spread out much more quickly. Kind of secondary hash function to yeah. who so spreads for uniqueness. I, I thought I had done this hack or had, I certainly have observed this behavior in the past. I thought I'd done this hack and I have a couple instances of non-blocking hash map. The one currently in use in AA was reprobing by one. So I put a reprobe counter in there and I did all the counts and, you know, over the course of sort of aggressive evil testing, I get millions of hash probes a second. It's pretty hash probe heavy. Um, with some hash functions being extremely low quality for having no information. So I get a huge count of reprobes. Um, by doing a divergent reprobe, I lowered my reprobe count by 10%. It wasn't a vast number, but it was an easy number to go compute. And I did my reprobes by reprobing using the hash, fun the hash value itself, which is unique on a node, but different for everybody in theory, you know, mostly different. Um, for people who have identical hash functions, which like I said, I have guys with low, low entropy, so they have identical hash functions. They, they just suck it up anyhow. They're, they're on the same hash list no matter what happens. Won't that burn more memory bandwidth because you're not jumping to yeah, the next so, thing? So, right. So you go back and forth between, I, I certainly went back and forth between, if you reprobe by one, you got a cache line hit for the second probe that was, you're guaranteed a cache hit. Um, and is that more or better or worse than a random repro, which on a big table, obviously I spew around memory randomly and you're not getting that, that behavior. And in my particular case, it was worth a 10%, almost 10% speed up as well as a 10% cash repro reduction. So it was worth it. Um, so you, you made your step the hash code itself? Yeah. Wouldn't and then I, then I man, man mask it to the table anyhow. It costs okay, yeah. me one x86 add instruction to do this and no other cost, which is essentially zero, it's a zero cost. So sorry, how, yeah, did, I, how I, did you get around the hash code having to be prime? I use a power of two hash code, hash table, power of two hash table. Okay. And, I'm, and I and mask. Yeah, I have some more specific stuff to say about all this. Like I ended up in kind of the same place that Cliff described, but a, a little bit different, right? And I think uh, there, there's a little bit of a different background assumptions, right? Because um, this is a different kind of programming language that I'm working in and a different, like I come from the philosophy of the way video game people do things, which just tends to be a little bit different than like general application programmers. So for example, um, so I'm not, I, I don't want to try to represent myself as Mr. Hash table dude or whatever. I'm totally not, but I, I know people who like are right. Who, Sorry, who from ship. now on you are Mr. Uh, hash table dude. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely not. But you're, but, you're giving up your title uh, cam? What, what sort of happened is a, a long time ago, uh, so, so we're trying to ship some general data structures with this language that people can use that will be pretty good for most people's purposes. But at the same time, I'm not afraid to say, well, if you want a little bit performance in this case, or if you want to do something a little bit more specific, that's on you, like copy the code and edit it or whatever, because I'm trying to get away from this thing like code just grows mysteriously and somehow becomes 10 times, 50 times as big as it used to be and like doesn't do that much more, right? So I'm trying to find this spot where it's like really useful, but also really simple and people aren't afraid to go look at it and understand it and all that stuff, right? And so I'd had this hash, hash table running for a few years that we've been giving to people. And, and I like, I sort of felt like it was fine, but then this conversation last week had me thinking about the reprobe and all that. 
And, um, you know, I went back and did some experiments and these experiments actually started with some stuff that I emailed Cliff about the birthday problem, which I, I think we'll come back to because it's maybe not the primary thing, but, you know, the birthday problem that everyone learns in school is that like, hey, if you have a, a class of 30 people or more, pr you're pretty sure two people have the same birthday, right? And that's, that's exactly isomorphic to the question of do you think two things collide in a hash table, right? If you have a 365 degree entry hash table, you're sort of asking every entry, what's your birthday? And you'll get a collision. And the um, actually, let's go ahead and since I'm halfway through this, um, why don't I do a screen share? Uh, how do I do that in Zoom? Um, it's right here. It's, oh, it's disabled. OK, I'll talk through it. Um, so on Wikipedia, you can go to a page uh, called birthday problem, and they have an entry further down the page that's like. Uh, uh, how about now? OK, I'm not muted. John, okay. you can share now. They have an entry further down the page that's like generalized number of days, right? Um, and so, uh, okay. Okay, John. People... Whoa! Oh, there he goes. Yeah. 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 So it's this page, um, or it's it's called arbitrary, arbitrary number of days, and you can see what this equation is. And what it says is that actually, as the as the hash table grows, collisions become more and more likely. And I, I emailed Cliff, and this is one of the things that I said, and then I said some stuff that actually turned out to be wrong, um, which was like, therefore you just mysteriously get more collisions as a table gets bigger and you have to worry more. It's not completely wrong, that statement, but I, I'm gonna have to get into like how, how it's wrong and how it's not wrong. Um, but like right after I emailed that to Cliff, I had, you know, I have this spider sense from being in computers for a long time. Like, wait, I just started out with things that I'm pretty sure about. And I ended up by saying things that kind of seem like an assumption, so I better check that, right? And so that's what kicked off this like several days of hash experiments. And as a result, we have a much better hash table to ship people. Um, but like there's there's graphs here somewhere about, I don't know, you can look at the page, but it's just interesting reading. It's interesting to read this page while you're thinking about hash tables, right? Um, Let me put that link in the chat. Yeah. In the doc. Um, but so just to finish this part, actually, so we can stop talking about the birthday problem and then we'll talk about probing and stuff. Um, I wrote a little program that just starts, it just iterates and it starts with a small hash table size like 512. These are all power of two hash tables and it just keeps doubling the size and it collects some statistics on it, right? And uh, you know, the smaller tables go pretty fast and it takes, it takes longer as I go. And we end around like a hundred million entries. And these entries are all like 64-bit uh, integers, right? So the, the point isn't to slam on memory really hard or anything. It's just like, ideally how many collisions happen and whatever. And so I'm measuring some things. Um, and one of the things I'm measuring is when does the first collision happen? Here we got really unlucky, wait. I guess this means no collision ever happened, Never mind. Yeah. Because you can't have it. But uh, I didn't exactly put an if statement for that case. Um, but, um, you know, I, I count the first collision index, like entry number 40, right, is we start at zero, so that's number 41. And then I say, uh, well, the total entries is 715. So that means about 5% through the, the workload, we got our first collision, right? And what you do see is that as the workload size increases, that goes down pretty consistently. There is noise. By the way, each one of these is like one trial. So like I've got some random number generator and I pick random numbers and I do one trial. So these, these have more noise than if you were statistically average for every table size, right? But you see pretty consistently up here, it's 5%, it starts going down. And then by the bottom, um, it's like, there's a lot of zeros there, right? Um, and that's interesting. But the wrong part of what I said to Cliff is that therefore, you have more collisions as the table gets bigger and maybe have to do a different strategy. That part isn't borne out by this experiment. So the total number of collisions divided by the total number of entries, when the hash function is good enough and the probing strategy is good enough, both of those have to be good. That is held relatively constant. In fact, it like mysteriously goes down here. I think that's statistical noise, but I don't actually know. But like, you know, it starts about 0 0.72, 0 0.73, and stays there the whole time, uh, even as the table gets way bigger than it was, right? Um, now, uh, okay, so what this number is, is just, what's a collision? Well, I count, I count the initial collision and also a reprobe collision the same for this score. So this number of collisions uh, right here is anytime we tried to look at a slot and like somebody else was there, right? 
for, for any reason. Um, and then the number of entries is just, this is just the table size times the load factor, uh, which in this case is 70%. Um, I know you guys were talking about like 80% and stuff last week, but in, in games, people are pretty consistent these days. People like open chain hash tables, right? They did um, for, for reasons you guys talked about, about memory locality and stuff, although that comes up in a minute. Um, but people also uh, seem to like load factors lower than the traditional ones. Um, so people in games seem to like 70, 75 kind of neighborhood. And that, that seems to work well for me. Um, and then the reason that we like load factors in games is because it gives you a knob that you can turn if you want to spend even more memory to get more performance, right? But uh, it's, it's not about making your hash table compact, which is what people sometimes think load factors are for. It's the opposite, right? It's like, let me just fire hose memory to make this as fast as possible. Now that said, that trade-off is very different in a systems language kind of runtime than it is in something like Java, right? Like if you're storing things that have pointers, you're gonna pay for that table size. Well, no, cause you're gonna pay for that table size whenever the garbage collector runs, right? No. No? No. Okay, well. So then fine. Uh, so it's the same trade-off. Okay, I don't have enough job okay, experience. But it's very, that. very nominal. It's a, okay. yeah, very well, we, we might have different definitions of nominal, but it's, well, it's no, not the main point. So if you, if you have a big table and it's yeah. been around, hanging around for a while, it will be, it will cost nothing by the presence of itself, except that you have to scan its contents if it's full of pointers. I yeah. certainly run tables that are full of ints, primitive ints in Java. Sure, yeah. There are no pointers in there and there ain't yeah, nothing to well, scan. So that, that's a zero cost for the GC thing. Totally different scenario. But yeah. let's talk about the reprobes for a second. Yeah. So, so oh, oh, to finish this discussion, there's something here that I don't <laughs> understand still, which is like, okay, how is it that you get collisions earlier, but also not more in total? And I, I'm imagining in my head that it's some kind of, there's some kind of statistical bell curve thing and it like just gets wider, but the area under the curve is somehow the same is like what's going on, right? Um, I want to learn more about that and, and figure it out, but I, I, I don't know. I would claim that the first collision point is totally dependent upon the size of the table. I'm staring at a, a, a sea of a million blanks. I can't hit somebody else, no matter how hard I try, it's too big. But, but it's the opposite of that. You collide earlier. With a bigger table. Well, I'm later. looking at your ratio of all entries. The first yeah. the those numbers seem to be going up logarithmically, which is what I would expect. Oh, wait. You know what? First collision. I'm sorry. Look, the ratio index. of all entries yeah. is falling off logarithmically. Yeah. Like, okay. So imagine you doubled your hash table by yeah. you double the number of entries, but then you write a special strategy where every time you store something, it's two slots wide and goes into two consecutive slots, right? That's like exactly the same as your half size hash table because you're just, you just scaled everything up by a factor of two. And the difference between that and like a real hash table where you have a reason to scale it up by a factor of two is that those two slots are not consecutive. They go anywhere. And that just affects the statistics in an interesting way, I would say, right? It makes it different. So like, it, like if you had asked me two weeks ago, like what happens as you scale the hash table up, I would have been like, well, probably everything's proportional, right? But it's not, it's not actually proportional. That's, that's the takeaway. Um, but yeah, so the collisions are happening roughly proportional to the square root, but the number of entries is growing linearly. So I would expect your ratio to be a linearly growing thing, a square root growing thing over a linear growing thing, and thus fall. Yeah, I mean the 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 Wikipedia yeah. article has the equation that you can look at. I mean it's. <laughs> but yeah, the Wikipedia look article is looking for first collision. You're looking yes, for collision well that's ratio. that's different. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. Anyway, so to talk about talk about reprobes, um, I also got a lot of clarity about reprobes just thinking about this because it was something like because I was always very hand wavy about hash tables. It was something where I was like, yeah, what, that's something people have thought about, and I don't care, right? And then I started benchmarking benchmarking my hash table, and like I was counting the reprobes for big tables, you know, these hundred million size, and um, my average reprobes per entry. Um, this collisions per entry thing was like around 12 before with my previous implementation uh, for large I'm sorry, tables. Say, say again? Uh, this, this number here, this collisions yeah. per entries was like 11 or 12. So it's tremendously lower now due to the changes that I made. And so if you only got 10%, either you started in a much better place than me or you didn't well, do I, as much as you could. One I, of those I, two. I started, uh, 
a year ago, I had a much worse hash function that I diagnosed and eventually I put this out here a couple of times, Bertel, Bertel.net. This guy has done a bunch of hashing. He had yeah. a fantastically, stupidly simple with good, strong concepts why it really hashes well. And holy fuck, it worked really well. And that gave me a much better hash where I had information to yeah. get a good hash. Actually, one, one more thing to say about the growing table size thing. Um, if I put in a bad hash function, yeah, like I'm going to square the integer or whatever, right? Then you would expect more collisions, obviously, because it's a bad hash function. But what's interesting is the amount worse, whoops, let's actually make a release build with not a backslash, the amount worse that it gets. So I'm starting out, that number that was 0.7 is now 1.8, 1.9. That's not a surprise, but it actually does grow with, uh, with the table size, right? Um, yeah, I, that one I kind of expect because that was my repro problem. Yeah, but that's that's actually, you know, I had some vague experience along those lines, which is why I believe this story about you get more collisions as the table gets bigger. And you do if your hash function and your repro function are not good, but you don't if they're good. And that's that's okay. kind of interesting. You know, it's like it's really starting to pick up at the end here. So I think it, it would kind of get well, exponential. You, you pick maybe. square as your hash function if instead you did something like shift it left by one or two and or some bits in you'll get a yeah. lot more collisions on people with a different range of values sure yeah yeah and suddenly I mean, you'll get a lot worse yeah it's not the worst hash function in the world for sure i mean the worst hash function is like return one or whatever but um so so then so, so the interesting clarity that i got about reprobes um was Okay, and if I decide, if I don't confuse myself by thinking about the other kind of hash table and I'm only thinking about open chain hash tables, there's really three kinds of collisions, right? So, so I'm gonna call them type one, type two, type three. Type one is like your hash function just returned you the same number for two different pieces of data. And like, you, you can't do anything about that. No, no right? saving it, yeah. Just get, get a better hash function or whatever. Or, right. or, I mean, that's always gonna happen a little bit. So you have to like not fall on your face, but like, okay, we, nobody's surprised that that's a thing. We do, I don't think we need to think that hard about it. Um, type two is I got two of different values from my hash function, but they map to the same slot in the hash table. And clarity on this. So this is a little bit confusing because way back in the day when I first wrote the hash table, I wanted to be maximally simple. So I was like, oh, the hash function maps your data structure into a slot of the table. And of course that changes as the table size changes. You can conceptualize the hash function as having an output being the table slot. And some people online do that, but it's tremendously more useful. And I think the way you guys have been mostly talking about it is like, if you think about it, the way that a cryptographic hash is or, or whatever, you run it on some data, it gives you back a number. That number is well-defined independently of your hash table. And then you do this final step, like in a power of two hash table, you just and by the number of bits or whatever, right? Um, and as soon as you conceptualize it that way, right, it's clear that, uh, it's clear that there's this problem and, and, and Cliff's talked about this a little bit already, but like, okay, you have two entries that map to the same uh, entry or, or slot in the hash table, right? But their hashes are different. And so there's more information in the hash that you can use to disambiguate them somehow, right? And so to, to make the probe diverge, uh, you could do that. But, but like, if you go, if you go online um, and you read hash table advice, you'll read all this stuff about like double hashing or whatever that comes from academia and like, as far as I can tell, that's completely unnecessary. You don't actually need two hash functions to do any of this stuff. All you need is two different ways to map your hash number uh, into a slot index. And as long as you pick two different ways, like for example, one early thing that I did was, you know, to pick the initial slot, I like anded by the low bits, right? That's very fast. And then to pick the reprobe index, I like did mod by table size minus one, which is relatively prime with the table size, right? And so two people who land on the same index with the and are gonna be scattered relative to the mod. Um, but the mod is expensive, right? And so that, that like maybe wasn't the best strategy, right? Okay, but so type two is people, uh, people map to the same entry, but have different hashes, right? Um, and then type three is, well, you, you got a collision and so you occupied via a probing strategy, some other slot that wasn't the one that you initially would have preferred. And that slot later ends up being used by somebody else, right? And so that's a collision in a place that's like uh, um, a oh. function of the, of the probe function, right? So the initial collision is like a function of your hash function. 
And then the, the type three collision is a function of your probe function. And so like Cliff was saying, um, there are, it's very important actually, uh, the, the main way that I reduced my things by more than a factor of like 11 was just make sure the probe functions diverge. And, and my original probe function was just add one. Cause I was like, I wanna keep it simple. I want maximum memory locality. Let me just like sweep linearly. And the problem with, with plus a constant for any constant is it has, it has this property that's bad both for type two and type three collisions, right? So if you imagine type two collision, two guys land in the same slot, but they have different hashes, then no matter what the probe constant is, they're both gonna walk out to the end of whatever this chain of probes is that you're building. And then they're gonna go on the end. And that's like your maximum worst case there, right? And for type three, it's also just as bad because if there's some other probe chain that's like building up somewhere else in the hash table, and then you start building one here and you collide with that one via a constant probe, now you've connected both of them, right? Because there's a constant offset and now they're both like a super long chain. Right, and, and so probing, any probe that has that property, which is basically, most of them are probably constant values, is very bad and it, it wrecks you for these type three collisions. But okay, so, so a simple way, my current probe function is actually, it starts at some number that is based on the hash, like Cliff said, and then I add one every time. Um, and the reason I add one is, uh, I actually not sure. I need I need to justify that a little bit better, but that's what I do, um, because it was like it was like taking this linearly growing hash and then applying it to like or linearly growing reprobe and applying it to a different offset point, right? Okay, but but whatever that probing function is, if it's only a function of the slot index, it does not help you with these type two collisions where people end up in the same slot index, right? And so. And Jonathan? Jonathan, what I what yeah. I say is it's kind of the same problem that you have in a pseudo random number generator, right? You've, you've got a seed and- You have to make sure it's relatively- The number has to look range. totally random vis-a-vis -vis that seed, right? So yeah. basically you're, you, you don't use a slot, you use the hash as for all practical purposes, a seed, and then you take the next pseudo random number from it as your next hash, so to speak. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah, but ba so, so basically I ended up in this place where I, I realized, okay, for type three, it can't be a constant probe. And I see constant probes all over the internet, so that's weird. And, and to avoid type two collisions building up, uh, your probe function has to be a function of, like if, if your probe acts on whatever information you have after you alias these guys to each other and destroy the information, then obviously you can't ever break them apart, right? So you somehow need more information than that. And the thing to realize is you had more information in your hash. You don't have to go all the way back to the original data type, right? So that's where I ended up. I got way better numbers than I started with, so I'm happy. Um, there's lots of bad advice about hashing all over the internet is the other <laughs> thing I discovered. And I'm glad that I have friends uh, who have a great deal of experience uh, in these things, uh, but it was like a fun, it was a fun couple yeah. days because uh, yeah. you know number go up or number go down in right, any right. way is like a fun. It's thing a tractable problem. Yeah, it's a fun problem. All right, how do I stop my screen share here? Uh, I don't see oh, a button do for too. it. Oh no, it's here. Never mind. Okay. I uh, plan share. to make my code to visualize the hash function into a JavaScript, so you can write a JavaScript to visualize it, not to uh, go need to compile it. How? How good to how good right. you spread your hash values? I, I have I have, I have now I have two things I need to say. So first, oh. Mark, you, you you asked me about reprobing by adding the hash, and I, you got me thinking. And I think you're 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 spot on. Everyone who adds the hash and they collided, I'm adding the low order bits because I'm modding off the table size. So adding the low order bits, which got me to the same hash, means we both added the low order bits. We end up in the same next slot. I got a better reprobe, but it. Probably is not the better, I, best I can do. So just while we were yakking, I changed it to take some of the higher order bits down low and add them. So thank you for pointing that out. Oh, the, so then, the comp, the compromise that I ended up with, by the way, because you said you use the whole hash code. I just said, well, if if this is just like, if I'm not worried about still being like O oh, n squared, whatever, in the computer science sense, and I care about what actual numbers come out, I can like just use a subset of the hash bits. So like I, I use the top five bits right now. It's literally like divide your thing by 32, divide your number of collisions by 32. And it's still super linear probably, but like uh, it, it doesn't show up in these tests, right? Um, yeah. Why is that better than just shifting down? 
I, I just, collided you know, on my bottom 20 bits, shift the whole thing down by 20 bits and do it again. Oh, that's what I'm saying I did. I, I threw in the, the Google Docs, my current as of 30 seconds ago hash function, which I just tested and it works fine. I didn't get numbers out yet, but it, the only difference I did there is I took hash and it shifted right by 16 to bring some of the 16 bits, high bits down, as opposed to taking the top five high bits, which it also would have worked. But you want some bits that are outside of your power of two table to come into the power of two table in order to shove it around. And then the other thing I want to say, and Theodore brought up was um, visualization tools. Way back at Azul doing the custom hardware, we were having, we knew we had these tiny caches and we were trying to figure out how good they were and whether or not we had, you know, goodness or badness. And we had some disagreement on how well they were working and, and we were confused about a bunch of things. So we ended up writing a hash, an, an iCache and dcache visualizer tool to show what was landing on the same cache lines and how hot the cache lines were. Um, because at that point we had all this, you know, we, we could do a reasonably good job of doing silicon simulation. And so we had millions and billions of instructions simulated run through uh, hashes, the, the caches, sorry, which were all obviously power of two because they're hardware. Um, and we discovered we had all kinds of fun, stupid collisions, like all the stacks started at some big power of two because we laid out our stacks on a two meg boundary for TLB to cover your whole stack. So multiple different stacks running the same problem would end up with the same stack depth and their caches would their yeah their stack pointers would land up in the same places in the i in the decache and they would stomp each other and then we did cache coloring stack coloring it's about stack coloring we added a random offset to the base of every stack so that these guys would all be in different places in the uh, l2 caches um but we had a tool that let us look at that. The other part of the tool that came out of that was um, looking at iCache collisions and discovering that they're heavily lopsided. You get a you get a like a, an exponential distribution. Some set of lines get all the love or hate or whatever, and some set of lines get no use at all. And effectively, your table, your iCache is reduced by some factor of like ten or twenty percent because a bunch of hot guys are fighting over the same cache lines and they keep evicting each other. And by doing code layout offsets, you push the hot guys around and you can get straight up performance because you're not missing your iCache so much. This was again on a four-way associate of iCache. These days, x86 has been eight-way for a while. I don't know if the problem is as bad or if they got rid of it by going eight-way. But you know, back in the day, I could I could go measure and on a four-way associate of cache, I pretty clearly wanted to do code spreading of hot methods, the hot inner loops. Like the entire compilation unit for a jitted thing was maybe big, but there was some hot piece and I knew what was hot. And I wanted to shove it around by inserting knocks or a jump forward or whatever you had to do to go make it land somewhere else in the iCache. Fun things to do with cache visualization tools. Same problem um, as repro if visualizations. I, if I find the time, I maybe try to make a JavaScript version so we can write your hash function and visualize 300 well, you, get, you gotta look at your your hash values uh, or your what you're getting out of your hash as well yeah. as your reprobes and stuff such yeah yeah, yeah. I, I ended up with both i can count my hashes and how good they mm -hmm. are separately mm -hmm. from counting my reprobes as they land in whatever yeah. size table and how they're getting used I have a question about the instruction cache thing that you just said. Like, yeah. I, maybe I don't have all the relevant content. Is this code that was being modified by the runtime? Because if it's read only, I don't understand why people would fight over it, right? Oh, because there's only four way associative. So you can only hold four unique oh, virtual yeah. okay. addresses. Never mind. As as, yeah. Okay. As soon as the fifth guy shows it. up, he kicks out one of the four. Yeah. I don't think about caches enough, obviously. <laughs> Well, it's a big part of all, well, you know, this is a huge performance thing. Yeah, fine. iCache misses are actually quite expensive because you can't even start the fucking instruction until it gets loaded into your iCache. So you don't even get to start the decaches you're going to be dependent on and everything else, you know. The yeah, well, I mean, are brutal. The, the fact that the first time you page code in, right, yeah. it's cold is starting to be like a big deal. Just like, you know, they're working so hard on these CPUs to get them to do so many instructions per clock and, and all these things. And like, you don't, you don't get any of that on cold code, like at all. And Amdahl's law says you're kind of dominated by cold code at some point. So yeah, yeah I don't know. It's complicated. Yeah. 
Well, you, you want that eye cache to be working. At some point, it quits being cold and you're good to go. But if it's always effectively cold because everyone's hammering the same lines, yeah, yeah, life's, life's tough. Oh, okay. Next topic. Yeah, I'm going to throw out a short uh, AA uh, update. So as you know from last week, which Joe doesn't find, uh, I was dealing with theory issues. They seem to be winding down. This week, they wound down. Uh, all tests pass in the worst possible modes with all kinds of horrific testing things. Um, I look solid. Um, and it was like, like putting together a puzzle. You start by dumping the big pile of questions on the table and sort out what you want to do with your typing theory or not. And you find all the edge pieces and they line up easily. And then, then it slows way down. You start to find little chunks here and there. And you're not sure where they land in the puzzle, but they look related. And you put them together and you're wrong and you're right. And you twist them around, you get pieces backwards and forwards and you screw with it. And I was in that zone for a long time. And then this last week, it felt like the puzzle's coming together and I'm having more holes than blanks or something. And I'm filling in the holes more rapidly. And a bunch of things that uh, 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 that were wrong became obviously why they were wrong because everything that was around them was right. And a bunch of things I had done to solve wrongnesses I was having became unneeded and irrelevant, in fact. And I just cut them out um, because I had something else wrong that was causing me to daisy chain a, a wrong thing on a wrong thing. So it kind of felt like it came together this week. Um, I claim I, well, I shoved it to master and uh, all, all my bad, evil tests pass in the worst possible ways. Okay. And I'm looking on to the next thing. Last I heard you talk about this, you weren't sure you were going to be able to keep the approx. Oh, uh, yeah, kill the prox. Thing. So it's it's gone? and It's gone. Okay. I, I worked on that thing for a month, and then I decided I couldn't actually... I, I'm still not certain it can't be done. I couldn't find a version that either that was monotonic and didn't suck. And that was kind of, you know, and I, like I said, I tried really hard. Um, so I gave up on it. And instead, in a bunch of places where I approx would have given me local information, efficient, cheap, easy local information, I had to go hunt remotely. So I'd add a bunch of places where I had a, a, a far distant look for values that because I'm doing this for the theory side, it's all on an abstract syntax tree for a fucking lambda calculus. And nearby and far by are like really screwed up in a tree. So it was ugly hacks in the algorithm, but conceptually simple. In an SSA form, I think they will not be very far, PZ will not be far removed. And so it will still be local in an SSA form. Um, that I'll get there when I get there. But like I said, I, I think this time I got it. Knock on, you know, knock on particle board. Um, and I'm actually going to spend the next week cleaning up odds and ends, like do a code coverage tool and see how many useless pieces of code I wrote that are not actually necessary to do the, the theory anymore. Um, I suspect there's a fair amount of them and I'll simplify the algorithms more. And then I'll be on to implementing it in the core language instead of in the theory side. So that's, that's my updates, it's, it's a victory. <laughs> Congrats. Yeah, thanks. So I have a question that probably will uh, uh, result in a 45 minute answer. Um, for my compiler, I'm like slowly making my way through fixing bugs for the type checker, which now for the most part works, you know, barring bugs, uh, barring a really annoying one I've been debugging today. Um, <clears throat> but I'm basically reaching a point where I have to start thinking about the uh, sort of next IR to use for a couple of optimizations and um, probably some more advanced, uh, not really type analysis, but analysis. <laughs> um, for example, things like, um, yeah, I'm not sure we categorize by, you know, analyzing if variables have been moved or if they need to be dropped. And it's not reachability analysis, but that thing, the thing that Rust does basically, lifetime analysis, yeah. let's call it Rust, that. Uh, Rust, um, the theory <laughs> side of Rust is uh, linear logic, linear something, something. Yeah, it's right. linear logic. <clears throat> uh, uh, affine yeah. types, affine types was the correct. Um, either way, that one. Um, and the second one was um, uh, exhaustiveness checking for uh, pattern matching. It's not really IR dependence, but 
uh, would be nice if the IR uh, is something you can sort of do that with easily. <clears throat> um, point being, I sort of understand you know, the IR probably has to be linear and graph based. Because for example, for this lifetime analysis, linear analysis, whatever you call it, uh, you have to determine like, hey, I have a variable here. And in my, if I uh, discard it, drop it, whatever, and then the else I don't, is that valid, for example. Mm -hmm. You want a specific IR to... to no, no. So, so my question was going to be, um, are there any sort of good suggestions for the approach to take there? Uh, I think probably worth mentioning SSA is something I'm probably not going to do for a while oh, because well, I, I am targeting okay, bytecode, right. so it's, it's a little less crucial I, as far as I understand. I, I, I only... SSA, I have the same answer all the time. And, and I was going to say okay. sea of notes, I still don't fully understand. I've read it, the paper. It's SSA all the way. <laughs> So that's the start. And otherwise, it, I mean, well, we can step, I can step you SS to C of nodes if you want to go through that. It's otherwise it's um, the same form with everything. No, so, so I, I roughly understand it. It's, it's one of those things where I, I really have to force myself to actually read the paper and you know take my time and go through it. Yeah. Usually, when I see papers, I'm like, oh, this looks interesting. There's like the mathematical mumbo jumbo. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm done. There's no mathematical <laughs> yeah. mumbo jumbo. It is, it is, it is less, in, it in is less important if you're just emitting an intermediate. <clears throat> because where SSA C nodes really takes off is the uh, optimization uh, pipelines. Yeah, that's exactly like just to run bytecode or just to transcode it to something else. You don't, you don't need to know. So okay, <laughs> so the the whole thing that SSA is is it was the newfangled late eighties, early nineties answer to the question like, how do I know? It's not that old. Yeah, it is. I, I <laughs> do. I did. No, no. I did SSA in college in like nineteen ninety. Yeah. It's that old. Yeah. Um, C of nodes isn't right, but but like SSA is, but like it was the replacement for this older thing that's still in compiler books called def use chains, right? And and all it is is a way of mapping like what time is it right now in this piece of code? Okay, which I might have multiple assignments to whatever this value number is, like which one is it, right? Because if you don't know the answer to that question, you can't reason about it like at all, right? But but it's purely an optimization thing, right? To run that code and not reason about it, you don't you don't really need it. Um, the other thing I would say is if you are interested in SSA, um, the, the thing that's super confusing about SSA is this fee function thing. And that's a horrible way of explaining it. Like it's the worst thing in the world. There's a reformulation of SSA that I wish I could send you the link for, but every place where you would have a fee function, you just think about it this way. You've got your code. It's divided into basic blocks where a basic block is just, you know, there's no other way to get in into an intermediate into into the middle. You have to go into the top. There's actually two kinds of basic blocks. This one's like major basic blocks or whatever, right? So I don't care if you jump out, but you can't jump in. And then anytime you're going to jump in, block. yeah, anytime you're going to jump in, then any of these value numbers that have a lifetime that's earlier, you just supply who they map from in like a static go-to. So it's almost like a function call. It's like, I'm gonna to go to this position. And by the way, I'm passing this and that and that. And that's equivalent to SSA and or, or to fee functions and all programmers understand it. You can look at it and not go insane because, because like, like fee functions are like come from statements as opposed to go-to statements, right? They're like, yep. yeah. But like, if you, if you look at it that way, it's very easy to understand and make sense. Now that said, I haven't even done SSA we don't know. We're just starting to do optimization, so uh, we haven't decided. Right. Now, so yeah. I understand the sort of rough concept of SSA, and I have a couple of useless compiler books that, that cover it. And I know it is, um, I think it was called extended basic blocks, where yeah, they basically yes. take out the five functions, fee, whatever, <clears throat> and they give the basic block blah, basic blocks arguments, which I think is a bit bit easier to wrap your head around. Yeah, for um, example, I think Swift compiler does use this notion of arguments to basic block instead of fee nodes. So, so it is used in practice in uh, production compilers. Okay, so, yeah. so let me throw my two bits in here. The, the fee nodes versus a function call are like exactly, exactly synonymous. It's just a slight name change. So if you wrap your head around one and not the other, <clears> great. <throat> And then the other piece that I found confusing about SSA that when I got rid of made life a lot easier was that there's no fucking reason to do minimal SSA, which involves a very complicated, horrific algorithm, which in practice doesn't remove as many fees as you care about. 
So if you have some extra ones, eh, you have some extra ones and they don't really screw up any part of your analysis that comes along or any of the performance of the IR or anything else. So the, the hotspot compiler uses SSA all the way. It builds SSA incrementally from bytecodes by a one pass linear algorithm, which is as stupid as stupid can get. And it's not minimal SSA, but the algorithm is stupid and fast and efficient, fine. The next thing that happens is during the course of the optimizer, you find fee functions that merge all the same things. And those are identity functions and then you get rid of them. And by the time you get rid of your identity calls by just doing standard people optimizations on a graph, you're very close to minimal SSA for no cost and no complexity, mental complexity cost. So, it, you know, and then, and then if you want, I'll step you through how to do build SSA. Uh, it, this is like stupidly easy, build SSA algorithm that Hotspot has been doing for 25 years. So I have to do it now because I've opened my trap. So, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I was going to say that that might be a bit too much. Like I, I will probably okay. forget it in five minutes. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's five minutes of conversation. That's, you know, uh, it, it's really I, I think easy. the probably what might help there is the context um, <clears throat> that on this IR, I do want to apply optimizations uh, inlining, for example, um, probably de-virtualization to some degree and a couple of the sort of standard optimizations. Uh, but since I'm targeting bytecode, I don't really give a damn about trying to fit it in as few registers or Is it your trying to code? basically <laughs> have all the optimizations yes, you can right. normally have. Right. Um, just the, 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 the common ones where you can say, hey, this is good enough for you and then the, the next couple of years. What IR are you targeting? Uh, this is custom, you know, homegrown, gluten-free. You're spinning out machine code or you're spinning out C to a C back in? No, no, it, it's, it's bytecode for my own VM. You're spitting out bytecode? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, okay. so, so the compilation setup there is the compiler ends up spinning out basically a single big bytecode file, or bytecode image, as I call them. Okay. Uh, and then for every module compiled, they contain all the, all the stuff. <clears throat> and, and the VM runs uh, runs it as a register VM. Okay, and does but you're not doing machine code generation, which no, no, uh, a jet compilation IR. is something where, where I yeah, where, yeah, that's when I get alcohol problems, but we're not there yet. <laughs> yeah, fine. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so is that sort of the, the the setup? All right. So let me let me step you through this SA building algorithm because it's maybe a lot simpler than you think it is. Um, so. Can you, or you know how to build a, a DAG of def use chains for a single basic block where you are going to walk through the instructions. Probably, a, so off the top of my head, I don't remember it, but probably when it seemed like, oh yeah, I remember. So you look up a name, right. it's X plus Y, X maps to some node in the DAG you're building and you see the plus and you make a new node for the plus and it points the X to the X lookup node and the Y to the Y. And then that was assigned to some new value T and you map T to the new node and you, you iterate through every step through the basic block. This gives you, you know, you get sharing when X appears multiple times because you point X back to the same guy and you get a DAG. Okay, from a DAG version of things, the only difference is that at the start of the basic block, you have some incoming values that are mapped to things that came from before. You need that map. So every basic block has its own map. And at the start of a new basic block, you pick up the maps from the prior basic blocks and you put a fee for every variable that has, it shows up in any of the maps. And literally that's it. There's a stupid hack at loops where I aggressively insert mappings for the back edge I haven't seen yet. And you get extra fees that are not minimal at that point in time. But otherwise, if you're a forward flow only, no loops, you get a perfect minimal SSA in one pass by just doing the name lookup map to a node and, and iterate your goes. It's literally look up a name, get the node, look up the other name, get the node, look up the op code, produce a new node for that op code, assign the, you know, the lookups you did already, and you're done. And you lather, rinse, repeat, boom, that goes straight through except at a loop where you, you build a mapping for everything that might change in the loop and you don't know yet, so you just everything. And How are you, you storing all those nodes in the list of things they point to? I, I allocate a node. That's the IR. It literally, so I that's say, just make an object that yeah, has yeah, an array. I literally, of I'm, I'm in C code. I say malloc a node object. 
And then I, it has some pointers, it has an opcode bit I throw in, you know, opcode field I throw in, it has some def use, uh, sorry, use def edge pointers. And I do my node lookups. Those are my defs. The node I've got is the use. He puts his use def pointers by just filling in the pointers. It's like a malloc. One hash lookup for every name that's an opcode entry to the, for the opcode I'm writing. So if I'm doing a plus, it's two entries. Two pointer stores, walk away. Oh, I guess, and then when the thing's done, you reassign it into the map. It's a new guy, it has a new name. It goes in the map and the new name. In case of Java bytecodes, your names are things like stack offsets, because I pushed and popped on the Java stack and I have a stack offset name or a Java local variable, uh, bytecode register name. <laughs> Those are the only kind of names you get, but it's just a name to node mapping. So a uh, practical question there. Um, in my old crappy Ruby compiler, I did have sort of basic blocks um, and a, a graph, uh, air quotes, because I didn't really make use of it. Um, one thing that there um, to sort of uh, determine unreachable code, what I did, I had sort of a, a structure that represents a method function, whatever. Uh, and it then had a list of all the nodes in it. And those nodes were then sort of linked together based on you know, which ones the, uh, yeah. were reachable. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you have unreachable code, you end up with some number of nodes in that list that don't have anything pointing into it. Yeah. And so the way I detect that was to go over those nodes, you say, hey, does it have a parent basically? No, yeah. okay, you know, add an error. Yeah. Is that sort of how you're supposed to do it or are there um, like I, I, better ways? Right, so that sounds fine. In the C of nodes IR, I do the next easier step that takes less work, costs less time, produces a better answer. And that is periodically I walk the reachable graph starting from whatever I'm considering root or the exit and going forward and you know, walk my use step edges. And I typically mutate while I'm doing this and I copy them to some new space. The old space is an arena and I throw the whole arena away. And everybody who was not reachable in that walk was dead and I didn't touch them. So I didn't cost me to walk them. I didn't ask the question, are you reachable or not? I walked the live stuff like an incremental garbage collector and a standard garbage collector does with young gen. I walked the live stuff, I copied the live stuff. The dead stuff I never walked, never touched, never looked at. Yeah, it's a, it's a dag. So anything you don't have a point to just dies. It just dies when you copy it. Yeah, you only copy the right, right. stuff. But so in that case, if, if you wanted to add some sort of diagnostic for saying, hey, you know, the, the code in this block is unreachable, since you iterate only over live objects, how, how would you do that? Do you then just iterate over the dead ones afterwards? Or? So generally, you, you don't do that. In, in an optimizer, yeah, you don't care. Hang on a sec. Oh, yeah, let me explain, because I, I used to do that and then realized I was being stupid. The, um, at the AST level, you want to identify AST that's not reachable because that actually corresponds to code in the in the source code sense. Yeah, that's it. You, but you, wanna, you, compile, you wanna mark source code. Don't say AST. Yes. You wanna mark source code that's not reachable for an error message for the user. AST that's a different problem. Code. AST is source code. So yeah. Okay. Each each AST has some chunk of highlight on the screen. Think of it that way. Yeah. So I have an AST node, it's made of a smaller AST node and a smaller AST yeah. node. And I have the same thing without any any AST. So that's why I'm I'm arguing. Don't say AST. You have a mapping to source that you want to present you to the user. Choose to not call them ASTs or ASTs. All Fine. right. So um so basically uh yeah, you can think of it as a coloring uh, uh, thing where you color it and whatever doesn't get colored is is an error, something like that. So but you do it at the AST level, not the IR level. Because once you're down in IR, you're happy to wipe out anything that's not reached. And you do that in a, some iterative or recursive fashion. And the more you wipe out, you know, if you can get down to zero instructions, you're done, right? <laughs> Program runs really fast. Right, so in that <laughs> case, fun. I, let's say you have your AC, you know, let's say you have a hypothetical function where it's like, you know, print something, print something, return, print something. Um, right. If you want to sort of dictate that, that or determine that that last print is unreachable, Right. Um, if you're you doing this to, in the uh, AST level, we basically have to, when you encounter that return, you have to somehow set some flag saying, hey, everything that uh, comes after this you, in the same scope yeah, is you can, unreachable. You, you can either can represent I, it as an AST unreachable. Oh, go, go ahead. Yeah. Hmm. So I would have walked the tree. Oh, you got it. Oh, we got a picture coming. Right. I would have walked so, the tree. So what I was going to follow up saying is that if you do that, 
you end up with this kind of the, the way I envision it is at least the way I have it now is sort of each scope in my compiler. Uh, oh, specifically, uh, the compiler uses essentially the visitor pattern, sort yeah. of. Uh, you know, each um, yeah. ASD node has a function that does whatever it needs to do, and they get a scope structure which says, "Oh, hey, in this scope, uh, you know, your variables like this, uh, the expected return type is that, whatever." So what an efficient you could do is set a flag that just says, uh, you know, unreachable. You and then don't, you don't return need... sets it. And then the moment the next function encounters it, it produces an error. But it it, it feels like a bit of a weird yeah, setup. Yeah, but don't honest. set a flag. Like, like, to the extent that you can do it, don't have any side effects in your IR or your AST other than accumulation of new facts. Because you've been all kind of weird bugs with stale bits and shit. So, so in the case of this one, though, you walk the AST at some point where you're going to print error messages. It's time to print my error messages. I'm walking my AST and find all my error things to go print. Well, I hit a return. So at some point of the walk, I pass along a fact from the return. And that fact is there shouldn't be anything after it. So the next guy that shows up, he gets an error message saying, you're done. This is an error. Well, so I the do. Two, the two okay. things that we, we track are, are completability and reachability. So completable means that the DAST goes on to the next thing, for example. Uh, reachability uh, means that somehow you get there. Um, so if you're reachable, uh, so here's the, here's the codes not reachable error, for example. Um, <clears throat> you know, so it's not reachable. We haven't already said that something's not reachable because you don't want to print out the same error for every line, right? Um, and uh, so, uh, then you, you log the error and you just mark locally that you're not going to log that same error within this context. Right. Okay. This sounds basically what I had in mind, except you know, here you're using a, a local variable, sort of a field summary, but more or less the same thing. <clears throat> this, this sounds one of those cases where I was probably overthinking it. I was like, yeah, it should, they could probably come up with something really clever. It's like, no, just use a for loop and a <laughs> Boolean. <laughs> right. Um, but that's been a bit of my recurring issue. It's like, with all this compiler stuff, you refer to books and it's like a hundred pages of stuff, uh, yeah. often a bit pretentious. And I'm like, no, right. this can't be the way to do it. There, there must right. be a simple way. Right. In AA, when I do the error message for this kind of a problem, I don't unlink it. I leave it in the graph, but every node has an, I'm an error and I report anything. If I have an error call, I walk the graph and call the error call, which is mostly null if you're not an error, or I get an error message back that goes into my list of errors, and then I sort them and emit them afterwards when I just gather up errors from everybody. So if you said return followed by some more stuff, I, I would gather that up with the return and basically saying, you know, and here's the thing that followed the thing that can't be followed, and your control flow would put in, I get a control flow edge leading to a node that just actually called error message. It's a particular, a lot of nodes will just produce errors if they have shit going on that's unrelated. But in this case, you'll get actually an error message node. What and, keeps uh, that from having the NAND problem where your errors keep merging and swallows the whole world and you just get one error back that's like broken? I'm sorry, say again? The, the NAND? You want to give multiple errors if you've yeah. got multiple things that are broken. What yeah. keeps your errors from just swallowing the entire world? Oh, the the... They do, but only up to the only after them. The first time I run into an error, I I the two different flavors go on here. There's a there's the syntax parser error. First time I run into those, the error message keeps eating you up until the end of the scope. Um, because there shouldn't be anything after here, and I don't care what you wrote after the first error. I'm I'm, I'm done here. <laughs> There's a flow version which says the whole piece of code was dead. So the fact that you had unreachable code, I don't care. And that's me being special at AA versus other languages where errors and dead code, I don't care about. The flow version uh, does a flow analysis and the error guys, guys who are gonna return an error get a special bottom type that says I'm an error now and that flows forward. At the end of the flow properties, the first time you transition from a reasonable value to an error value, I report the border but I don't report after the border because some guy took an error message in, it's poison, he gets an error out, he's it's not interesting, he shouldn't have an error in in the first place. So the other thing to mention is that 
you know, the all your optimization should be around the cases where you're not encountering an error. Because as soon as you're encountering an error, someone has to look at it. It's going to take seconds to read and minutes to think about or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, you're not trying to save clock cycles on, on error handling. You're trying to save the clock cycles when you're not hitting them. So if you have to stop and spend a whole bunch of time walking long linear lists over and over again with errors, perfect. Make, Usually, make your, errors, make your errors better, save people reading time and comprehension time. Usually well. there, yeah, there is a strategy to uh, stop errors from reoccurring because another error. There's there is some kind of same. Uh, there is some kind of save point. One save point can be to jump if you have an open brace to jump to, directly to the closing brace in order to avoid the errors. Some some good places to start to resume parsing. Um, the definition of a class is uh, some good. How point. to how to resume parsing? That's a different question. So it's how to resume parsing. How to recover from an error. That's mm -hmm. a syntax, not a semantic error. Semantic errors have their own thing. You don't have this issue. Syntax errors you have to recover from. Hmm. I don't have any better answer than anyone else here. I use the classic, here's a common error. I'll look for a common fail and do a common recovery strategy. And On otherwise syntax. you get shit for shit if you mistake badly. On syntax, it's called expurgating. Where basically hmm. you're in the middle of some pile of crap. You find some syntax errors. So basically you're looking to get out of that mess zone. If you want to, if you want to be able to report more than one parse error, yeah. So you you expurgate until you reach a, a new clean zone, which I think Tito is what you're talking yeah. about with a class yeah. or a closing yeah. curly or something. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I don't have enough experience with AA to know what a good version of that is. So I'm, I'm mostly kind of looking for closed curlies to claim I'm, there's, I'm exiting. Yeah. The there's no perfect answer. It's it's all mm -hmm. about statistics at that point because yeah. because people. And, and by the way, it's even worse now because a lot of these, a lot of what you're doing now is actually for live editing, right? Oh, yeah. So you want to be able to mark as someone edits, right? So basically you need to cordon off just the area where the edits are going so yeah. that you're not, so you're not trying to parse outside of that zone. So it's like, you kind of want to remember where the closing curly is. So no matter how many opening oh. curlies they add, you're not trying to match them until they reach a, a stable point. Mark Falco so, talked about this before. I do a stupid hack. I put in an open or closed curly in the wrong place, and my IDE pauses for a second and red highlights 99% of the remainder of the file. I'm like, oh, so fuck useful. it, dude. It's so unhelpful. Yeah. And, no, and, you know, like, if you didn't pause, I wouldn't fucking care. But no, you have to drag that into it. Okay. Yeah. Then I then I you know type two characters. Oh, it's all good. And then and big pause and oh, then takes I another four seconds while it cleans up all the red. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, oh, come on, dude. Get a fucking clue here. <laughs> As it happens, I too recently watched some techniques to to build a parser that uh, can uh, reparse the when we reparse the code is pretty quick. It's an order of microseconds. I can share a link. Three sitter basically uses uh, some kind of techniques to oh, avoid. Like okay, uh, um, well, I will share it. Just a sec. Yeah, like for me, parsing, uh, sorry, incremental parsing and parsing recovery is something where I'm like, no, yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to do that for for quite some while. I have to do it if at some point I want to uh, build a language server. Um, but yeah, sem semantic error recovery is trivial. Um, at least in my type system, I have an error type. And in various places, uh, if, if I say call a method on something, it checks explicitly. Is this an error type? Yes, forget it. You know, yeah. Don't do anything. So you are that way you don't end up with like 15 this. errors just because the first one was wrong. You just published some big update, right, York? I uh, just the, the monthly one. Uh, yeah, you want to put the uh, link in oh. the, the doc? Oh, yeah, can... sure. Uh, uh, oh, Firefox starts doing stuff on its own. Uh, this is what uh, your swag gets you. The, the first one off cool. is mine. Cool. cool. I, uh, that's cool t-shirt yeah should i put it in the chat or the talk mm. uh, the, the doc the, in the doc yeah the doc uh, the doc sort I, of consolidates time so just dump it there there we go yeah. oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. since oh, i'm no, talking anyway i guess section. i should do yeah, nothing. i will there i will edit yeah. it okay. that's fine uh, but no but basically yeah, the last month i've been uh, fixing or implementing the remaining parts of the type checker uh, it's not fully enabled yet, as in it currently runs for uh, instance methods, static methods, module methods, 
So I think two or three other method types I haven't enabled it for yet. That's mostly so I don't get like 5,000 compiler errors as I make my way through uh, updating the standard library and then fixing bugs. Um, but yeah, as part of that, I added support for like proper pattern matching before it's just sort of a switch on a type and that was it, but it didn't support generics, for example. Um, introduce proper sum types and probably going to change my error handling model, which essentially uses uh, exceptions when checked to using sum types. Because um, I found it, the current system I have sort of checked exceptions done the right way. They, they're quite nice if you have the need for exceptions, uh, but they're quite annoying to compose. Uh, the classic example, if you have an iterator where some function takes a closure in my system, as the author of that function, you have to decide, is this closure allowed to throw or not, even if you don't really care about it? Uh, so you end up with the system where you might not be able to throw because somebody said, no, we're not going to let that happen. Um, but it also ends up being verbose when you just want to take the output and pass it along. because so you essentially have multiple return values, so you have to handle both of them. Whereas if you have a sum type for a use something like a result type for errors, your closure just say, oh, I just returns some generic value. I don't care what it is. And I just pass it along. Um, I have yet to decide on that because it's one of those things where um, I I often have these ideas. I'm like, oh, I'm going to do it differently. And then I implement it. And two days later, I'm like, oh, no, wait, it was a stupid idea. I shouldn't have done that. So here's a paper on tunneling exceptions through iterators. So, um, so it, it, in my language, it is supported. Uh, it okay. works. It's not bad. It it requires just a, a bit of annotation noise, so to speak. Yeah, right. So if you have a function that say maps values in an iterator, and the uh, iterator is allowed to throw, in your map function you then have to say, hey, I return a iterator that also may throw. Or if you have a function that says um, it it takes a closure and an iterator, and it then just uh, returns true if some value in the uh, iterator, uh, the closure produces true for, so your classic uh, any or all functions for yeah. iterators. Um, the iterator might throw, so then you have to say that, let's say any function also has to annotate a throw type because when it advances the iterator that might throw it, it has to propagate it back up. Uh, I have it in the, in the blog post, but you end up with basically a lot of generic error types every time you want to take a closure yeah. And you want to give people the option to throw errors in it um, yeah. on top of your generic return types, probably. And it's just that sort of duplication where I looked and I was like, yeah, I kind of want to get rid of it. Yeah. It does yeah. sound like one of those patterns that leads to source code explosions. Well, or, or everything, yeah. everything gets yeah. converted to the default error handler or the error that doesn't require you to put it explicit throws or catches yeah. or anything. You will most likely a, end up with some generic error. So yeah. passed around yeah. in order to avoid. Right. I don't fucking care. Don't make me think about it. Right. Yeah. And, and so I was, I was basically looking at the code and it's like, this, this is starting to look an awful lot like Java. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want that. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the thing... Um, you know, the type checker for the most part, no, it works. I've uh, been squashing bugs left and right. I'm now fighting an annoying bug where uh, my uh, generic type parameters are not inferred properly for nested types. So yeah. if I have a list class and it stores a field uh, that's an array of type parameter, whatever, yeah. uh, and I push into it and you then get back, my compiler's like, that's the type parameter, not the value we just pushed in. And the, the, the code is at the state where I understand what's happening, so uh, the result, but I'm not entirely sure how it's getting there. Like, um... I, 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 I claim that I had a great deal of, of success with fuzzing on my, attacking my typing algorithm with a fuzzed, fuzzed yes. of those things. So for now, I, I kind of stopped doing unit testing for it. So okay. much of the type checking rules, for example, they are unit testing because they're fairly straightforward. It's like, you know, I have type yeah. A and I have type B and I expect them to be compatible. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, got a lot of those too. But for the sort of larger parts, like, hey, I have a compiler pass that's supposed to define all the methods with the signatures. Blah, blah. No, I, I do manually for now because it's changing so rapidly that I will be spending more time updating my tests compared to- Well, I was saying for fuzzing, I make an, a thing which generates a series of 
typables or typed or however you're going to get to it. And then I feed it into the typer and says, internally, I usually get an assert that you failed. That's what I'm looking for or not. Uh, and the, the common thing I do is, for me is that the is a test is the question. So I produce an array of exciting types that I don't know anything about, except they're exciting. They have some number of depth and width and height and blah, blah, blah. Then I pass through them in an N squared pass, comparing each to each. If they ever report is it to each other, then I do something with them both and compare is on the output. Um, and because I have these piles of exciting things that when I get a blow up, it's usually fairly simple, fairly straightforward and fairly ugly looking at you would never hand write such a thing because the you know fuzzer does something brutally stupid. Right. Yeah, that, that's probably something I'll do for, for now. My quote unquote fuzzing is my standard library. I, I think I had the right. benefit that because I had a working compiler before, albeit with different semantics, yeah. uh, I have a working, I had a working standard library. Yeah, Change okay, it, I'm not sure if it still works. Yeah. yeah. The thing uh, with the fuzzer you can do though is I capture all the seeds involved. And so I have a, a jig harness for rerunning just those seeds. And so I just cut and paste the seed from the fail message. And then the jig gives me just the one thing without any of the standard library shit, nothing else, just the one dude. And so it's way easier to go sort out why this one guy is screwing up. Uh, uh, fine, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I think it's a good time to turn our attention to annotations. Oh, yeah. Modifiers. Simon, you were I don't, I, I would guess that was Simon. Yeah, it is Simon was writing stuff. Yeah, so we can expect it in the Google Docs. Oh, and, and whoever um. wrote the comment for the Rhino of Roar, I actually use a Roar in my hash function. I should, you're right, I should pick up the Roar. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. Mm. I, I do an OR1 for the comment so I don't get a zero. That, that prevents me, that makes me odd for my power of two table. Mm. Yeah, uh, so at comment. worst case, you at least are still walking. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Simon, can you, if you did you if you wrote this, can you um, some somehow showcase uh, what is the exact conflict between modifiers and annotations, and what what part you, the, the did you take? Yeah, uh, all right. So I'm um, not sure we can make it with the time, but I'll give it a try. Um, so basically, I was. Um, I was so my my general interest uh, my general interest is in the area of uh, asking how we can take all the existing uh, uh, lessons we have learned over the past decades and can repackage that a bit in newer languages with an eye on keeping the expressiveness of the things we could already do in older language, but making the, constru the constructs uh, cheaper. And um, I had, I, I have more things, but three interesting topics that came up and uh, which I can uh, show how it turned out in the end uh, was um, one modifiers and annotations, the other one was uh, unified condition expressions, and the third one I called uh, non-definition enums, and in the end, the, the basically the the the, um, the motivation is the same. Basically, take something existing, um, have a look how we can make it uh, smaller, cheaper to implement, and uh, basically free up some of the complexity uh, budget of the programming language to all the fancy stuff we want to but it's not really my interest overall to invent fancy new stuff so um the first one uh, is uh was the modifier modifier versus annotations uh, thing and um if you look um i think i missed the beginning what at, are you trying uh, to express with the annotations sorry what are you trying to express with the annotations? Um, annotations are just uh, whatever metadata you want to assign to some programming element. So I don't want to express anything. I just acknowledge their existence in a way. I'm just looking but, at, ex sorry. But annotations, um, 
Okay, we have to talk about it. So what the, what um, uh, does it have to be a annotation or a keyword? Because uh, here you you mark final as an annotation in Java is a keyword. Uh, yeah, let me let me uh, share then maybe mm -hmm. if it's possible. Then we can. Okay. Um, can we when we can mark it yeah so yeah yeah so so basically the thing is uh, both modifiers and annotation exists mm -hmm. um would it be possible to only have one of them and if it's possible which one of them or which parts of those do we want to pick and which one mm -hmm. do we want to discard and um in the end uh, modifiers are keywords mm -hmm. in almost all languages. In some languages, there are contextual keywords, but yeah. doesn't really matter much. And on the other hand, uh, we have annotations, which are basically defined in source code somewhere. They have probably some namespacing that we need to import, or at mm -hmm. least we have some global uh, prelude where they are included. So, and so on. so they are very different uh, in terms of uh, built into the language versus um, just some source code yeah and all the restrictions that follow from that so so okay what 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 is the behavior you envision for annotations uh, because java it just ignores them mm, here the final annotation just um, prescribes the behavior of the function below uh, what should uh, what is the role of annotations in this in this case in this case so are they mandatory are they prescribing a program behavior how how do you describe them advisory so, or required okay yeah, yeah so basically um the the move i made was to say okay um i'll adopt all the um mechanisms of annotations so they have source code you can navigate to them they have namespacing and mm -hmm. so on but i acknowledge that a small subset of annotations uh, needs uh, need to be known to the compiler and need to be known very early to the compiler for instance you have like a, an annotation static or an annotation final where it's crucial for the compiler to know very early on, OK, um, where is this method actually from? Or like, I have this method. Is Does this method exist on the class? Or does, is, does this method exist on an instance of a class? So mm -hmm. um, what we are doing, uh, what I'm doing is we have all the, the syntax of like normal annotations, but um, and we also uh, saved that in the ASTS. Um, I saw some annotation there. This is the name of the annotation. This is maybe the um, the parameters of the annotation and so on. But it's the uh, but we need basically we need a name resolution check and uh, during transformation of this earlier um, untyped AST to a, like a fully typed AST. We require that um, the annotations uh, are resolved. So we basically know whether this is like the static annotation from a language core library and has semantics that the language expects, or whether this is just some annotation called static from some third party library that has no meaning whatsoever. And at that point, we are basically saying, okay, we have this a subset of annotations and um, we have our AST and the AST has some Boolean flags for static, final, override, and so on. So we are trying to expose um, a very simplified uh, version to the, to the people who, who would, to, who would uh, write the code. But internally, we allow for some uh, special magic happening, as long as it doesn't uh, escape this uh, this fiction of it's just an annotation. So, um, so is it fair to consider this just compile time execution? 
I want to call some derived thing, it's going to mutate my program as it's building the program. And all annotations are just about saying, here is some execution I would like to happen before the binary is produced. Mm -hmm. um, so from the current implementation, uh, no, but um, it's basically, um, um, so a, 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 um, a possible evol evolution is to say, okay, um, we move the implementation of the annotation. So not like the source code bit with like, this is an annotation, but the implementation that says, okay, if you have this static annotation, do the following checks in the compiler. Um, I'm, I see the possible evolution to basically move this implementation from the compiler to the annotation definition in the standard library source code. This comes with all kinds of issues and troubles. So I'm not going there, but um, exposing this uh, compile time or meta programming facility with annotations is certainly something I've uh, thought about. So you use some the annotations to somehow make a custom semantics, as I understand it, custom semantics of the, uh, to decouple the implementation of semantics from the har from the compiler, as I understand it. Um, I, I'm I'm not doing that, but I see the possibility to do it. So uh, hmm. I think derive isn't even implemented yet. And even if I implement it, it will first be something that's built into the compiler. And only if there is some actual benefit of moving the whole machinery yeah, to because of, by the library, then I'll have a look at it. Because the thing is, if you use a keyword like derive instead of annotation, this is uh, somehow hint that that is it has a full compiler support. It's embedded into the language. It's a concept, it's a abstraction that is fully absorbed into the language. You intended to use it and you just name a keyword for it. Yeah, yeah. I, so, I'm I'm not really um, I like I don't derive is just some some example I'm not really um, convinced either way whether it should be a real keyword or something else. Java here you just said uh, implements serializable instead of derive stringable, but what I'm hearing you instead say is I want to make up some syntax for this kind of a thing and be able to extend my syntax basically with some kind of semantic meaning. Mm, yeah, it, it depends on on uh, on what, you, what the annotation is doing. So I'd say if like, if you have a derived annotation, it's a bit more than um, some implements interface thing because I'd expect that there would be some code uh, generated to facilitate the derivation. So um, either at uh, what, what does stringable or, mean? So stringable came from somewhere. Yeah, it's think of it like an interface that contains a two-string right. method or something. It's it's really it's like it's, a show. It's yeah, exactly. It's like it's a not, show in Haskell. Exactly. Sorry, it's, what show in Haskell? It's uh, basically methods. Uh, it's an interface or a trait or a type class that has a two-string method. Yeah. yeah, but the two string you're saying is automatically generated per person. Mm -hmm. If you if you add a annotation, if you add the annotation, for instance, you get an automatic two string. Mm -hmm. which, exactly. Which somewhere in the world looks up the parts. Yeah, does the it. compiler do it, or is it coded into stringable? Yeah. Like reflection based. I think it's meant that the compiler to do it. Into this, uh, this is trace. Uh, this goes into the Haskell derive uh, the Haskell type classes world. To, with but, the derive keyword. I, I'm, I'm, I'm coming out from a different question still yet. Mm -hmm. There is a thing that says I can take an object and serialize and deserialize. It's guaranteed by by injection, the, the, the two, by injectional, the two serialized, deserialized forms map back and forth to the same thing. One is textual and can be written to disk and back. Um, but maybe it's not the version of a person I want to look at typically when I look at a person. Then there's a version of a two string that I want to come out of my debugger, 
which doesn't print mm -hmm. a lot of junk that I don't typically care to see, but I want to have a convenient debugging experience. Maybe I have a third one that is the default person, which does first name, last name, doesn't present their zip and address typically or whatever. Mm -hmm. There's more than one of these and which one are you referring to? Mm -hmm. And are you automatically like, one of them I can automatically generate. I know how to do that. Mm -hmm. One of them yeah. I do not, the other two I do not. Yeah, um, I have some designs in that, in that space, but it's, it's, not, it's not related to annotations or anything. So um, my approach is to have um, two string uh, or stringable, if you want to call it the interface that um, to have some uh, representation that's intended to be uh, uh, human readable, okay. uh, developer readable. And uh, it's basically an interface. Print, and, right, print all the fields recursively. Sorry? Yeah. Pr print all the fields recursively. Structural recursion, print all the fields. Yeah, so Field basically. Equals value. Yeah, so basically you, uh, it's an interface. You need to implement it. Otherwise, you can't call it. It doesn't deal with uh, with loops or anything. It's just not uh, a it's, it's, serializer. Yeah, it, it's it's very it's very uh, restricted in a sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And okay. uh, completely different from that, uh, my current uh, design idea is to have a runtime method. So we are basically it's not something that's implemented on a on for for a type, but we are saying something like. Um, language dot reflection dot debug string is like a static string. Um, you can put anything in there. It's implemented by the runtime. It will try to sort out loops in some reasonable way. So um, doing at least some matching, uh, some magic. And uh, the most important difference is that the, this debug string method uh, returns an empty string if I'm if I'm not compiling it for debugging. So I can use the debug string, can yeah. leave the calls in, but uh, if I'm uh, if I'm so it's uh, like an assert in the land of Java or C. Yeah. If I'm not compiling a bit like that, so and in fact, yeah. assert in Java is just a normal everyday runtime thing, except it's a guarded by a constant static value, and the JIT looks mm. at the static value and says. It's static, it's final, it's false. The if code is yep. dead, all your code is dead. I did to nothing, life goes on. Yeah, so basically that, that's that's a basic idea. I haven't really tested the idea against reality, but that's, uh, that's a general approach I'm trying to do here. And um, apart from that, um, I think the, the basic lesson of this is it's possible, but uh, it's, it's like it, it really restricts uh, the 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 order and the way you uh, you uh, build the compiler phases to manage this annotation thingy. And um, if you're not, if you're chicken and the egg, sorry, chicken and the egg. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It's a chicken and egg problem. It's like you have to bootstrap the compiler really carefully so that the annotation is actually there when you try to figure out uh, if you're actually using it or just some some uh, annotation that has the same name but doesn't come from the standard library. But I think it's, uh, it's also beneficial because um, if you're doing things not the correct way or having uh, some hacks um, somewhere in the compiler, you will find uh, you, you will uh, find out very soon because things will blow up quite easily. There. Jonathan, uh, I think Jai had similar functionality to do some execution at runtime that can yeah. mutate things as you're building your world. Is that right? That what's all? Yeah, I mean, cases? it's. I don't. I can't claim to have a clear picture of of what you guys are talking about. But um, yeah, we have a whole system for compile time code modification. Um, it works pretty differently from this. So we have a thing called notes that are like passive, like things that you can add for, you know, runtime introspectability or something. And right now they're just strings and it was on my list to like make them 
be arbitrary data structures and it like never seemed that important. It like saves you from parsing some strings at runtime and it, it gives you better type safety on them, but it hasn't been that important. But like, that's very different from our facility for uh, uh, both both code uh, verification and modification. And all, like all of that is like a whole different thing. Um, I don't think I would try to do that stuff this way, but um, I also, like I said, I don't have a super clear picture of this. So it's hard to really say. Well, given the time, do you want to go on to your, some of your other things here? Uh, yes. So I, I don't, I think this one was like good overview. Um, yeah. So um, I think uh, I presented this uh, uh, some time ago and um, the, okay, I'll, I'll repeat some of the ideas here for those who weren't there. Um, the general idea is just like uh, with, the, uh, with the topic before, okay, well, we want to take some existing things and figure out how we can keep the expressiveness of the language, but reduce the cost. And um, in this case, we are looking at if then else versus uh, switch expressions versus pattern matching or whatever kind of conditional construct you have in your language. And um, the core insight was that, okay, um, if you have uh, an uh, if then else expression, your condition is this Boolean thing. It comes first. It's of type Boolean after you um, um, evaluated it and then you have two branches and that's it. And in the case of uh, switch case or pattern matching, you have like, have a split condition. You have a shared part at the beginning that is of some kind in many languages. It's maybe some kind of enum. And then you have branches and these branches in in the case of a uh, switch case, they check with some kind of, uh, of equality operation against the value in the shared part of the switch case expression. And the core idea was that, okay, if we take, for instance, this if expression and say, okay, we relax the uh, requirement that this foo call here doesn't need to return a Boolean, then... It, it can be plugged into a Boolean expression that follows. Exactly. Then, then we can say, okay, this doesn't need to be a Boolean, but the combination of the common part plus the specific part, they all need to be of type Boolean. And then we are pretty close to switch case or pattern matching, but um, there is like one tiny bit of flexibility we actually gained on top of it. And that's, we are not limited anymore to um, equality operation. So in this case, we are still doing an equality operation like, with, like we get for free if you're doing a switch case, but we don't have to do that. We can write arbitrary code there. It's like, it's fine as long, uh, so, uh, as we're ending up with a Boolean expression. And I that's- wrote, I wrote the equivalent AA code in the chat and earlier in the docs both. Ah, uh, let me- Get, a, get an alternative view. It's, it, it doesn't have everything like right there. So we color coded it, yeah. No. So instead of dot, 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 I said temp. I said yeah. local variable that you can declare anywhere and immediately just assign to that part. And then, you know, life goes on. And so it can mm. be in dot size less than three. And the only thing that's kind of nasty is I have nested stack deep parens, which yes. your form does not. <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I did switch case in my stuff a while back and I regard it, it's primarily a user interface thing, yeah. right? It's like, look, it's, it's basically the same as a chain of if statements, except there's a bit of a question there about what exactly is the usefulness of the interface? Is it just that it looks nice, that people feel better about it? Or is there anything else? And, and this is tied to one of the fundamental questions that you have is like, should the conditions in the case, right? Uh, they could be like C style where they're required to be a small number of scalars are allowed and they have to be constant or it could be like 
like the version Cliff just showed where it's like, look, it's obviously just any expression. And I actually went in the C direction. And the reason is because I decided that part of the user interface that I'm providing is that you know that the, that the different cases are orthogonal to each other, which you don't really know. So in, in, in a construct like this one in the box here, um, so you, know, you can obviously have different conditions and stuff and that's more powerful. They also could overlap though, right? And if you're encouraging people to list them out in order, they just might not think about the fact that they overlap and maybe that's fine a lot of the time, but maybe sometimes it's confusing, right? And so what I use switch case for is, is just switch case is a way of saying that can't happen here. Yeah. Right. And so it's less powerful, but maybe that's good. Right. But, but I'm also not strongly opinionated about it. So whatever. Okay. Java went both ways here and they have now a version that says, um, these are all unrelated and I know they're unrelated and I can do completion on the missing guy or compile time error. If you didn't, didn't do them all. And then they also have ones that said these can overlap. It's basically an unrolled pile of ifs with a little tidier form because you get some shared piece in the beginning that we all agree that that's the key thing that you're deciding on but there's no semantic meaning says they're actually all different arms they're not disjoint sets they're in order first one hit wins and and i don't i mean i understand the it's very useful to have one that says i know these things are all different i want to state they're all different I want to write the code such that it's shorter and easier because they're all different but i want to look at it at a glance and say they're all different and i know it and then there's a version that just says, ah, I got some complicated thing I'm doing shit on. I'm gonna pass a bunch of tests and first one hit wins, but I don't wanna keep repeating <clears throat> myself over and over. Or if then else, if then else, if then else as a long staggered series of an if tree and you know, off the same thing. And if, if, if the if else statement is a statement doesn't return an expression, it becomes even more tedious because you have to enclose them in parentheses, you have yeah, to just, mutate a variable. Yeah, the main the switch statement becomes allows you to write the if else much easier, like a ternary mm -hmm. expression. The, the one interesting thing is that the example uh, Cliff shows if the temp variable is mm -hmm. uh, pretty much uh, what I'm doing underneath yeah. if I'm seeing uh, this kind of construct. And uh, I haven't decided yet whether it's uh, too clever, really sneaky, or just stupid. <laughs> Uh, basically, I'm hoisting the, the foo yeah. invocation out uh, yeah. into, a, into a value so that I uh, compute few, uh, foo only once, and then I just use it down here. Right. And it's uh, scaring how easy it simply plugged into the existing uh, compiler infrastructure, but I'm not really sure whether I like uh, using a dot, dot, dot as an yeah, identity. Can I hack name. the dot, dot, dot in particular? <laughs> Sorry? A, can I, I'm going to hack the dot, dot, dot in particular, and you can complain at me and then unhack it because you don't like it. Yeah. Underscore is a common thing for, I want a variable, I don't want to name it, it only mm. lives in this scope, it goes away thereafter. Um, yeah. I, I'm basically only uh, I'm basically only using the dot 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 because uh, I use it here as an indication that the common part is over and now the specific branch starts. But uh, I'm also thinking like of uh, just having something like this where we don't even ha have an indication. Yeah, your partial so has it, to sort that out, but maybe you can. Yeah, uh, it, it's uh, exactly if you say it's an uh, indentation based uh, system then you don't need a indication and then it stops measuring uh, what, uh, what kind of- go at the scope at the end of the if? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you want it to go at the scope at the end of the if. I use temp because I can throw new variables down, but it actually would have a lifetime that doesn't mm -hmm. stop at the end of the expression. So it's mm -hmm. not semantically equivalent. I'd have to yeah. curly brace wrap it to kill the yeah. lifetime. Yeah, uh, it, it, was, it was quite fun because the language already allows um, um, defining the same identifier twice in in a in a function or something that um, this just worked. So the methods uh, the the value name is weird, but the, all the rules that follow with like nesting uh, etc cetera, etc cetera, all just worked, and that was that was a pretty nice um, hack. Or maybe it's not a yeah, hack. Yeah. But, yeah. But one of the the difficulties I see here is um, 
you know, in the case where you're explicitly naming it with underscore or whatever uh, magic symbol, you can put that somewhere else in the expression, not necessarily at the beginning, when you can use it multiple times. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's wise to, to make it explicit in the expression. Mm, so uh, that you can uh, use it multiple times or? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll write a toy example in here where I'm gonna use it multiple times. You know, you want like underscore dot A equals underscore dot B. Mm. All right, yeah, yeah, understood. Yeah, so basically the current approach, um, it doesn't support that. I'm not really, uh, I don't really have an opinion yet whether it's, whether that's good or bad, I'm not yeah. sure. I wrote a stupid. Yeah, name. so yeah, Cliff's example is exactly what the kind of thing that mm. you have to concern yourself with. I, I didn't put it on the on the on some other piece. Like you could get nasty for sure, which is why I put it in temp in my example because it's just it's now obviously just a user variable. And you do what you do with the user. Mm. Like yeah, you can and that, many times or whatever you want to do. Yeah, I think uh, that's, uh, that in many cases there might be some alternative for that. For instance, in this case, it might be. Uh, something... Oh yeah, yeah. I'm not claiming you can't get rid of them. Yeah. I'm saying if, if you allow them, what what? How do you allow them? And if you get rid of it, then you don't have the the name of the variable appear, and it's implied as part of the expression. But it has to be the first thing of every expression, including your field reference dot size, which is a little. You know, it's a little little funky, mm. right? Like is nan is an argument. It's totally perfect. It makes great sense. Like I'm not doing equal equal nan typically because typically equal equal nan just doesn't work. Oh but god, we, don't do geez. Uh, this is like JavaScript for nan but, <laughs> equality. But we oh, have no, to. don't go down the equality wars. Stop the equality wars. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, basically the uh, about um the core insights here is that there are some different ways you can implement this. I've shown you one way um, that's a bit more high level. Um, an, an alternative is to basically simply buffer the tokens during parsing and for each branch, just uh, replay the com part. I think this is not the parser it. problem. This is a language. Yeah. I, I yeah. like that you are not forcing my tower of death. I have the, the tower of death version, you know, the, the nested friends keep going as your if stack gets deeper. And I don't like that. Yeah. But yeah. I should point this limits you to one expression per line, one one switch, one K statement per line, if you will. How would you uh, disambiguate uh, if there is a nested? Um... Oh, how do you disambiguate parsing if in the middle of his curlies that say, Square less than radius yeah. in, in yeah, between he, the curly braces, not the quotes. You add he, another guy. Here is a one expression per line because we formatted that way. But how we can disambiguate? Uh, That's you know, in our curlies. It saves them. Curly braces mm. saves you here. Yeah, but if you want, you want to nest this inside another construct, you know, of the same structure. Now, yeah, what does yeah. underscore mean? The mm. inner one no, or the outer one? The inner one. Curlies. Yeah. Oh, how do you refer, how do you refer to the outer one? Yeah, that, that's a, that, yes, our previous discussion. I, that's why I stressed that Scala okay. has a special special keyword uh, yeah, in yeah, yeah. case when you when you hit the case, you know that you, you are inside a new expression of the of the mm. match statement. Yeah, so that basically that's one of the reasons why I don't really give this shared part an official name, and uh, the dot 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 in my example are more like um, a syntactic. Um, indicator and not a real name in that sense, but yeah, um, yeah, I have some. I've implemented mm -hmm. some tests with like crazy amounts of nesting and stuff, and they couldn't break it, which uh, was surprising to me. But perhaps I just lacked uh, the, the inventiveness mm -hmm. to break yeah. my own code there. Yeah, we have to limit the magic, we have to restrict to some readability that shows the entire intention of the code because we Agreed. can always come you can always come with the syntax uh, with the combinations that do a lot of magic and if you can uh, if you can't figure <coughs> out exactly what, what uh, when you see the code what it means it becomes mm, yeah yeah in the end the the, the 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 goal is not to do code golf but to uh, <laughs> to like uh, so like uh, 
um, save some <coughs> some language complexity budget. And in this case, I'd say this construct is certainly more complicated than an if then else expression you commonly see, but it's less common uh, less complicated than having both an if then else construct and a completely separate uh, uh, switch case construct. Well, so, in, uh, in a language that only... if if else is an expression in a match statement or a switch statement is also expression, I would say you can eliminate that if else. It's all, always yeah. The, the, the thing that, that Joe said, which I'm totally spot on with, is there is a version we can put out here where it's obvious to everyone involved that all the arms are specifically a, a, a exclusive. Only one of these can possibly be true, and I want to express that directly in the code. Whereas the stack of ifs, I also do all the time, but they're clearly just done ifs in order. Yeah, yeah. The hope there is that if you have the same construct, that the exhaustiveness checks apply to some additional situations where you used if didn't think that it could be exhaustive, but now the the analysis that's basically now shared because you only have one construct now tells you, and I hope that's a small benefit of that. I guess what but, I'm trying to say is I want to go the other way where I know it should be exhaustive. I want to get told if it's not. So yeah. error at compile time if it's not exhaustive. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's that's what I meant. So basically, um, if you used an if then else before, you wouldn't have got the diagnostic right. telling you that. But because now you only have one construct, and of of course you need exhaustiveness checking for that construct. You may have some additional cases where you now get the analysis. Well, I'm saying that. That, right. There should be there should be a, a type a ticker. A syntax difference, a parsing difference, an eyeball looking difference that says this one's all exclusive, this one's a shorter way to do a tower of this. Mm. Annotation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's. Uh, I, maybe. Have uh, big, uh, I have a big opinion. All right, we're, we're, we're approaching our two hour limit. You want to do the core insight? Looks like. Uh, yeah. So basically, um, it seems to work well there. I have maybe implemented only the simplest parts yet, but yeah, coincide. Okay. Whether you call it if else or switch, so which keywords you use doesn't matter much, but I think okay. it's so it is kind like of instance of in Java and you're doing the pattern match Java instance of switch. Yeah, so yeah, so basically okay. if you if you do type based or like uh, pattern matching stuff, then you can't have, you can't basically, uh, before you had switch and it was uh, a different keyword from if, and then you yeah. knew, okay, now we're doing this pattern matching thing, but now we share the keyword. So now we have to basically move to indication. Okay, this uh, is now uh, um, a pattern match inside each branch, but it's yeah, just- Yeah, and I claim that if you, if you drop the else off, that I can enforce with a compiler error that you have completeness or not. Yeah, only yeah. only cats and dogs are allowed here unless you put an else on it, and that's okay. Yeah. I mean, that's a good way to say complete this or force completeness. If I yeah. don't have an else, you must be yeah. complete for the okay. instance of tree test. Whereas the generic expressions running down the line, they, they obviously overlap. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, that's I totally agree. Mm -hmm. um, so the last thing was um, I haven't seen this approach before, so I would be happy if you. See it and say, okay, I've seen this before, uh, seen this somewhere else. Um, so basically, the idea is uh, most languages have some kind of ADT. Often they use the enum keyword for that, and that's not like the enum keyword we know from Java, which is just an enumeration of flat values. But for instance, in Rust or in Scala or F sharp or something, Elm. you have these. Uh, mm -hmm. We have um, members of an enum and they have a payload. And the idea is, okay, uh, we, have this, we have this enum construct and uh, by writing this down, we not only define the foo, but also A and B. Yeah, and Elm, how, you know this. yeah exactly. And how would our world uh, switch around if we said, okay, uh, writing down A doesn't define A, 
but refers to an A in scope. And uh, this is kind of weird in the beginning because it's it's it, it's it's uh, it feels like a completely different uh, construct now. Where are you? Where do you need it? I'm, I'm Where would seeing... you need it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so basically, the idea is okay. We, for instance, we have like an enum JSON value. We would define our um, uh, enum members. Um, basically, in all the cases, we like say, okay, JSON, uh, JSON value can be an array, and the payload of this JSON array member is like an array of JSON values. And have a JSON number, and the payload is a yeah, floating object, point. Do JSON object. That's your, your next exciting uh, I, line. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so this sounds like a, perhaps a more compact way of of uh, using sealed types from Java. Yeah, you define the interface, and then you you explicitly explicitly enumerate all the classes that are allowed to extend that one. And yeah, I know. In a certain way, I think, uh, sorry. I, I think the, the, the core difference is that uh, with uh, sealed interfaces uh, and classes underneath, uh, you have a subtyping relationship. And I imagine, imagine this to more be like a wrapping relationship. So um, uh, we, I think we see the, the, the difference. Uh, I'll try to show it shortly. So basically, instead of having this, we just say, OK, we have an enum, and all the allowed types inside it refer directly to existing types in our uh, scope. So I say uh, JSON value can, can be an array of other JSON values or can be a float. And so on, and um, this of and course how that, that I can see when uh, you just eliminated the wrapping class, if you will, for an array of JSON value. It's an unnamed. How would you disambiguate it because it doesn't have a name right now? You see a exactly. bare word array floating around. Are you talking about a JSON value dot array or a top level array? Hmm. Who do who did you ask? Well, I asked Simon. You. You. Yeah. Oh, how, right. how do I distinguish when I see the word array just floating around in the middle of an expression that I'm referring to a JSON value dot array versus a, a, a top level array keyword? Mm. I, I'm I'm trying to figure out if you when you say array in the JSON value enum the last white space right there. Is that word array a local name to the JSON value? So it's a namespace limited name to JSON value, or it's referring to the st standard name your particular language uses for making an array. So you're nodding yes, it's a standard making an array. So now I have a JSON value is a collection of things that are primitives in my language, including floats and strings. JSON null, which clearly is not a primitive in your language. Array, which is a primitive in your language. And and uh, you know whatever other things I, I, I screwed around throw in JSON object. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's correct or not. Just keeping the hint alive. And now when I'm looking at the word array floating around, am I referring to some primitive in the language, or am I referring to a JSON value array? Yeah, yeah. That that's uh, that's an interesting. That's a that's a good question. So basically, um, the <clears throat> difference between here and here. Uh, isn't that small, uh, isn't that big when it comes to the runtime implementation. So for instance, yeah. if we uh, uh, distinguish the, these types by some, uh, 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 by some uh, tag bit or something, then uh, these here work exactly the same. Right, I mean, I understand semantically what you're trying to accomplish, I think I do, but I'm looking so, at the syntax and saying, you look ambiguous to me. Yeah, and and oh no, it's uh, now it's here. So and now, uh, if we have um, a function and that function uh, takes an array, let's say array uh, of JSON value or something, yeah, then yeah, we can uh, simply uh, call it with like well, whatever. 
So it doesn't you, matter. In your function definition, you said array of JSON value. Again, I claim that's ambiguous already. Are you referring to a primitive array with a JSON value at the top level, or are you referring to a member of the JSON value enum that happens to be the array member of the enum? It's it's not uh, it's not a type in itself. So um, it's not. A type so in it's, no, it's it's basically. I'm basically uh, what I'm doing is. Uh, uh, is saying uh, is basically um, I reuse this enum syntax because for arbitrary reasons or because I like it doesn't matter. But in the end, it allows me to have something like um, a tagged union type uh, uh, for free. So you're really, you're really when you say enum JSON value in the in the reddish text. Really, like someone on the hood just numbers one, two, three, four. They're part of a JSON value, but they're also just the primitives, or, or the second, the white box. They're just actually the primitives as they exist. But if yeah. I use a JSON value, I have a only got a tag, and it refers to the type of the thing. Yeah, types, yeah. Very similar to a type def. Is a type no. def not a tag union? Uh -huh. hmm. I would think so, that it, it implicitly would it would mean um, a union, I believe. Well, a tag union has got payload in the union, got a tag and a payload. Yeah. And in That's... a in a bare enum is what I'm hearing you say. I, I just got a number one, two, three, four. No, I, it's it's a uh, uh, num. Sorry, it's um, number plus payload. Sorry, sorry for that. Okay, now you go back to being ambiguous. When do I refer to an array of JSONs, no JSON value, no enum, one, two, three, versus so, I'm referring to array of JSON being an enum number one plus his payload. So, um, that's so for, for instance, like I have like this uh, function, it takes an array and yeah. I pass an array. The array is passed as a reference, right. no tag bits, uh, no, no, um, Discriminator, right. no anything. Right. If I use now this uh, enum type here. Yeah. Right, I'm looking for the third uh, case you haven't mentioned yet. There's okay. one more uh, case to do. Uh, give me a second. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, the, the core question I think is here. So I say, okay, I want to have a JSON value. Okay. I Can I add, add one more case that you that I'm having trouble figuring out how to disambiguate? Yeah, so, okay. So, um, I'm passing in the bare value of an array, yeah. which is, of course, not a JSON value in itself. So um, the core question is, OK, um, the compiler in, let's let's uh, ignore over building uh, enums with overlapping types. Um, I understand there is a problem there. But if we say, OK, we have this array here. We want to have a JSON value. It's completely clear what's uh, meant to happen here. Um, should the compiler automatically take this everything, put uh, the discriminator yeah. in front of it and just say, fine, I understand uh, what you want to do. Uh, okay, that's an if, implicit conversion. If the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Implicit tagging, if you will. Yeah, if the yeah. compiler, if you pass something, a type known to this uh, enum value, it automatically will tag it yeah, with yeah. the do index. Do you believe yeah. in implicit conversions or not? Mm. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's a question. It's basically the, uh, basically the, the question like, um, it's possible in many cases if we yeah. ignore that you have can have like overlapping types, but do we actually want to do this? <laughs> and if we don't want to do this, do we need to invent new syntax to I, write it down explicitly? For I instance, believe implicit you, conversions is yeah. not a short conversation. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So basically the question is, do we want to have this or right. this? And if we don't need to do this, we also don't need the syntax below. Well, the, the one I did there was saying it's not, it doesn't take any old JSON value. It only takes an array, a JSON value that's an mm. array version. Yeah, then you would simply write it down because there is, there is no, there is technically no difference between this and this. And so there's no, no reason no, no. for this no, no. to actually one, exist. One of them doesn't have a tag and one of them does. It Your first be... example that what you have right now when you erased my my lead in piece is textually identical to your first line there where you said fun foo array colon array JSON value. It's bit for bit a character identical. And that's what I'm saying it's ambiguous. This yes. one? 
This one says, I demand the tag one and a JSON array. And your first foo right underneath the word module says, I have a primitive array full of JSON values. There's no tag involved because it's a primitive array. Yeah, so I, I think I wouldn't, I, I simply wouldn't, uh, um, um, I wouldn't say that uh, this array of JSON value is, uh, is, is simply not a member or not some kind of thing that's, that exists on okay. a JSON so, value. Well, yeah, that's fine. Let me give you, give you an example. So in the line of Java, the standard enum tutorial says decks of cards with clubs, spades, whatever. And I make a function that takes a card. Can I make a function which takes a spade, which is a member of the enum for the class of cards? Right, so it's, you know, one is the, the, the flavor of the card and one is spades in particular and only spades, right? Well, in Java, spade mm. is not a type. It's yeah. an even I, number. Yes, okay, I, so I'm asking, that's fine. I would write it like this. So basically you have like a singleton type, like uh, what call it a spade. I'm not sure what the other English names are for the oh, cards. hearts, clubs, diamonds, uh -huh. but whatever. <clears throat> No, um, I, I got it from uh, Keith there. His point is that it's, I, in AA, I'm allowing individual unique values to be types as well. And in Java, you would say it's not, you can't pass, you can't declare it be typed as a space, yeah. declare it be typed as a card. Um, and so, so I'd, my problem goes away. I'd, I'd do it like this. So basically, I don't need those uh, things to be some kind of type inside of cards yeah. because these one here are perfectly legal types on their own. So what's the, I'm sorry, what is the... Uh, the type, the module type, uh, how... The module, module type becomes a member type. of the enum. I don't know what a module is. How it's inhabited, I, how do you make a value if it's a type? How do you make the value? Mm. Type uh, type consider, it, uh, consider it something like this in Scala or Kotlin okay. or something. Okay. So it's a value and a singleton type. and A singleton, a okay, and, yeah. a singleton object. What did you say, Cameron? Enum is type one. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I want to have tagged unions because they're incredibly useful. I want to have enums for which I know I have fucking unique constants because they're highly efficient for a bunch of cases. And then there are times I want to pass that constant and say, I'm passing the number three, but it's not really a three. It's actually known to represent the, the code for the diamond. I'm passing into you. And I want to say fucking diamond, but be strongly typed as a member of cards, not as a type def to a three. And then I lose all type safety on the other side of the line. Yeah, I wouldn't auto promote stuff from three to diamond. Well, that's the issue, right? <laughs> so, so instead, if I have a diamond, I pass along and you get the reverse problem. The receiver says, I know I'm typed as a diamond I want to be known as I'm typed only as a diamond, which happens to also be a three. And I'm going to do diamond things here. It's fine. Um, but I don't want to lose the fact that it's a diamond. And right now I can't pass, I can't declare the function to take only a diamond. I have to declare to take a card and I can assert that it's only passed a diamond. Simon, what language is this? Um, I'm just, it's the same as the language above. So, um, the, the interesting question is, okay, when you have these magic uh, kind of enums I've shown, um, how would you, how would you define an, uh, an option type? And that's, uh, actually kind of interesting because you have multiple options and, um, depending on whether you allow this kind of promotion, uh, you would uh you would be uh able to do something like this or maybe not like uh, and i remember from my times in scala that this uh this uh implicit conversion possibility was very controversial so you could right. always implicitly convert a value to an option of that value 
but uh, wasn't clear whether it was a good idea. And uh, I think it's it poses the same question here, where it might not be a good idea, but over here it could be a good idea. And the question is, what sets those okay. things apart? I, and I want to talk about implicit conversions another time. <laughs> not today. next time. Next time. Yeah. Because we're yeah, like two hours in and it's gone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it will, it's, it's a good topic. It's fine. Yeah, it it will cause of certainly the way you write it, it will cause of a lot of head scratches. I would say, because yeah, there's no. I, I've I've lived a little bit of Scala and implicit conversions were definitely a bane to me. <laughs> and of course, ints and floats get implicitly converted all the time, or at least ints get <laughs> floats implicitly all the time. So I don't want to say never convert implicitly, and I don't want to say always convert implicitly. So and then the answer is yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't like option types either. This... <laughs> oh, and separately, option types I don't like, but that's me. I'm, oh, I'm only because they're bulky. Okay, I like my bulky. question mark games I'm doing, my question mark call nillable games. Mm -hmm. All right, all right, let's declare victory. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I'm going to end your sharing if I can figure out how to do it. I've done it. Yeah. So cool. sorry, I was asking what the name of the language was. Is, is there a name for this work? Or? Uh, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's, let's, let's call it private. So, uh, a private language. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm contributing to, uh, uh, some other person's, uh, ah, project. So, uh, totally I don't want to, uh, claim or yes. drag the yes. language into it. So it's, I'm just trying to do polite suggestions and, uh, sometimes, they work out like in the cases where I'm pretty happy, but uh, in the end, I'm not trying to make uh, somebody else's uh, yeah. language that way or try to make decisions for it. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. All right. Very good. John, you, you got some closing comment here? Yeah, fun stuff. Okay. We... Yeah. yeah. All right. Next week. <laughs> Next week. Uh, Next. Have a good weekend, everyone. Yeah.